we went through hurriedly, I think, the last three slides last week, so I want to repeat those just real quickly. My, my main point in going over some of that was to show that, that science, the historical sciences in particular, are really not science as, defin as we define science because they cannot be really tested and verified. Uh, and so when you're looking at historical sciences, and I would include obviously evolution in that quote unquote science, it's historical. So when someone says it's a fact, it's hard to verify something that cannot be tested. And when someone says, as we read in the newspaper in our first class, that evolution has been shown in the test tube, that's just absolutely wrong. The evolution, as we know, molecules to man evolution has not been shown in a test tube. It hasn't, shown, and it hasn't been shown to be in any lab that I know of. So uh, that's just not right. So historical sciences, by definition then, are really not true sciences. And that includes cosmology, how the, how the universe began. Uh, that's a historical science. It includes evolution uh, and even creation. You know, we can read the Bible. We believe the Bible is, is correct, but actually proving how God created, you know, that takes, takes some faith. But I believe when you look at the evidence, the evidence is that there's a uh, intelligent design beside, b behind all this, and that intelligent design, of course, would be God. So what happens is man has to postulate theories and then redo them or refute them over and over again. You see this in the history of man. We'll be looking at this more later on, but in the history of, of mankind, we'll go through theories, and those theories become uh, almost fact, only a lot of times to be overturned <laughs> as fact later on. So uh, i use the example of the, the uh, Ptolemaic uh, a theory that the, the uh, Earth was the center of the solar system. Well, that was believed for, for, for many, many, many de uh, years, centuries, until it was proven not to be correct, but it was considered basically fact. So once again, we frequently have to abandon previous things that we believe to be true in science, and uh, I think that could happen with ev evolution now is the prevailing thought, isn't it, as far as how mankind began, it's unless you're, unless you're a, a Christian. I think we can look at the evidence and maybe eventually uh, refute that. And I believe we're, that's part of what this class is about. And Richard Feynman, once again, man still does not have a complete understanding of the physical universe and its laws. Each piece or part of the whole of nature is always merely an approximate approximation to the complete truth or the complete truth for as we know it. In fact, everything we know is only some kind of approximation. approximation because we know that we do not know all the laws yet. Therefore, they must be learned only to be unlearned again and more likely to be corrected. And so, if science has taught us anything, it's taught us that scientific theory is never permanent. Uh, and so we have to be careful. Christians want to kind of, I, I use the word here, marrowing, marrying ourselves to a theory because we want to be scientific. Some of us, you know, we're, we want to be considered smart, intelligent, if the scientific world believes a certain thing, we want to believe that. And so what you have now and what you've had in the past is you've had people that have tried to marry evolution into Christianity. And so that's why you have the theistic evolution, you have progressive evolution, all kinds of theories trying to, trying to connect Christianity to evolution and show where the Bible's sp speaking in, in uh, figurative terms and things of that nature because we want to appear scientific, but you have to be careful because that very theory we may be marrying ourselves to may be refuted. And of course, I certainly believe that's the case of evolution. And you know, scientists and mankind, we're, some sort, we're sort of arrogant a little bit because every generation thinks we have all the answers. You know, every generation that comes along scientifically thinks that they have, they have all the answers. But it would, be, it would be pretty arrogant of us in our time to think that we have all the answers when we know in the past science did not. So we have to be careful with that. So I wanna, I wanna finish this introduction portion by looking at some misconceptions and those were in one of the first handouts I gave you. And the misconception number one is that Christianity is a blind faith. That Christians just believe, that, that believe in God and believe in Jesus Christ because we just have a blind faith. <laughs> And we've, we've shown already in this class that that's really not true. Christianity is not really a blind faith. It's a, it's, a, it's a faith, but it's a faith based upon the evidences. And that's how we all uh, became Christians. We, we looked at the evidence for, the evidence against, and we believe that the evidence overwhelmingly is for Christianity. That's why we're Christians. It's, but it's not a blind faith. We don't go blindly into it. And if it was a blind faith, it'd be no different than any other 
uh, uh, religion or, or mystic religion that's out there. You know, just believe what you want to believe, but it's no more important than anything else. I believe the evidence is overwhelming. And Paul indicated that when he wrote to Timothy, he said he knew who he had believed. He says, I know whom I have believed. So he, it was a knowledge of, of his faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you should know the truth and the truth shall make thee free. It's the truth that we're looking for, really. Now science at this time, especially evolutionary science, is really not looking for the truth. It's looking to prove evolution. That's a, there's a big difference. There's a big difference to know the truth. They're not really, in my opinion, they're not interested really in the truth. They're really, they're interested in, in a naturalistic explanation of how the universe began and how mankind began. And that's a far cry from what we really talk about when we say that we're looking for the truth. But Jesus said, you'll know the truth and it's the truth that'll make you free. Oh, we, we will be using Josh McDowell's book, The New Evidences, which has been out a while now uh, in, our, in our second half. But uh, he had an, he, I don't know how much you know about Josh McDowell, but he came to Christianity as a, as a non-Christian, a non-believer. I believe his wife was a Christian and she had tried to persuade him um, for many years to become a Christian. So he just decided to really, well, I'm gonna look at the evidence. I'm not just gonna read the Bible and just blanketly believe that, but I'm gonna look at the evidence. Is, is, is there evidence of a creator? Is there evidence that he spoke to mankind? Is the Bible uh, a legitimate book? Is it a book that is a book of truth? And so he went to that to refute that Christianity was true. It wasn't looking to try to prove it. So he wasn't a Christian and say, I'm going to look at the evidences and prove what I already believe because he didn't believe it. But when he looked at the evidence, he says, I confirmed through investigation what I wanted to refute. So if he can do that, so can other people. And so can other people that we're trying to reach out to. So he mentioned in, in his book, Josh McDowell does, a few misconceptions that I want to go over real briefly and then uh, possibly get into the historical portion of, the, of evolution. And one of them is that sincerity matters. Now we see this in, in, denom in the denominational world, but we see this in, in, in just life as well. And the idea is that as long as one is sincere, it doesn't matter what you believe. Well, is that true? Jesus said you'll know the truth and it's the truth that'll make you free. So no, it's not true. Sincerity is not what counts. You can be sincerely wrong. You can be sincerely wrong about your belief in creation and sincerely wrong about your belief in evolution and you'll be just as wrong. <laughs> You're just sincerely wrong. For example, was there a resurrection of Jesus Christ? That's what's Christianity. That's the uh, anchor that Christianity is really all about because if there's no resurrection, you know, Paul says we should all go eat, drink, and be merry because it, it is the foundation. And he says that in 1 Corinthians 15, if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. It is an absolute must that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he was raised from the dead to be a Christian. And that doesn't matter what your sincerity is on the matter. You have to sincerely believe that, but you could sincerely not believe that and still be lost. So sincerity is not the issue. The second misconception is that Genesis is mythological and allegorical. Okay, well, you know, especially I, I put in the hand about the first 17 chapters. I really, that should be the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. A lot of people look at that as an allegorical, uh, an allegorical story, and it's not factual based. But when you look at the book of Genesis, how is it written? Is it written as uh, an allegory or as a myth? Not really, is it? It uses real names. You know, Adam had a real name. And then if you look at the creation, you know, look at the, I mentioned in the, in, in the handout, the, the four rivers that are in, uh, in, in the Garden of Eden. Those rivers are given names, like in some of those names we still know of, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Uh, so it's not written as mythological. So it's not mythological, it's not allegorical, and certainly when you get past the book of Genesis, you start getting into historical characters like King Saul and King David. You know, for a long time, his, his historians doubted the actual existence of even King David. Did you know that? Now, skeptics and, 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 and non-believers have tried to shoot down the Bible for centuries and centuries. Now, we know David was a true king now, he, he, he lived. And so the, the book of Genesis is not written as, as myth or allegory. So why should we read it that way? It's not written that way, it's written as historical fact. The other thing is, a corollary to that, is that uh, 
the Bible is not written by eyewitness accounts. Well, clearly the book of Genesis could not be written as an eyewitness account. Most of it couldn't, could it? I mean, nobody was around when creation occurred. You know, the Holy Spirit gave that to uh, uh, Moses, who we believe wrote the first five books of the Bible, but he wasn't around. But most of the Bible is written by a first-hand account, and certainly the New Testament is. And we look at 2 Peter 1, verse 16, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. So the books of the Bible, uh, the New Testament especially, were, are written from an eyewitness account. People actually saw Jesus, they touched Jesus, they talked with Jesus, they saw the miracles, and they're given their account. And not just one, and not just two, but many, 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 many did in writing the book, book and many saw Jesus. We have seen with our eyes, we have beheld with our hands, handled concerning the word of life, Jesus Christ. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, that you also may have fellowship with us. And that comes from John, 1 John 1, verses 1 and 3. And furthermore, uh, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Christ had appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. When Paul wrote this letter, many of the people that saw the resurrection of Jesus Christ were still around. They, had, they were still there to, to give witness, to give testimony to that. Some of them had, had, had died by that time, but, but many were still around. It says most of them were still, were still around. And finally, many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of His di disciples, which are not written in this book. What was the purpose of signs that Jesus did? to confirm that He was the Son of God. I mean, He could have just said He was the Son of God and people believed it, but the confirmation came by miracles. And then after He was resurrected, uh, miracles were performed by His apostles to also confirm the Word, that the Word that they were teaching from, was from the Word of God. But these miracles were written in this book, but these have been written that you may believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. What's another misconception? Some people will say, I have an intellectual problem with Christianity. It's just not intellectual. I have, you know, I've, I've looked at it, I've, I've studied it, which they haven't a lot of times, but they look at it and just intellectually it doesn't appeal to me. Uh, and so I have an intellectual uh, problem. Uh, but most people really don't have an intellectual problem. They haven't really looked at the evidences. So why do they not come to a belief in Jesus Christ? And Josh McDowell once, time, once again uses three different reasons. And one is ignorance. They just haven't looked at it. They didn't do what he did. They didn't look at the evidence. They didn't weigh the evidence and come to a conclusion that it was more, more rational to believe in Jesus Christ and to believe the Word than not. Some of it is pride, you know, uh, because once again, how are Christians looked at? You know, well, you're either a freak, fool, or fanatic if you're, if you're, if you're Christian. So it's prideful. And it's not, quote, scientific for whatever reason. But again, it's really not intellectual. It's a pride. And sometimes it's a moral issue. They just don't want to change the way they live. You know, they like the way they live. They, they like the live, live for the now type, type thing. And so they won't become a Christian. But it's really not an intellectual problem. You can be very, very bright and be a Christian. And there are many, many people, all of us in this room, I would even put in that category, that are very bright people. And we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And it's not, uh, it, 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 it isn't a matter of intellect. So don't let anybody ever tell you it's an intellectual problem because it's really not. What's another misconception? Oh, let me finish with this. And I, I thought this was a great quote from this French philosopher. The evidence of God's existence and His gift is more than compelling. But those who insist that they have no need of Him will always find a way to discount the offer. So if they really don't want it, they'll find a way to discount it. You know, whatever, it's myth, it's not true, it's fable, whatever. They're, they'll find a way. But the, prob, but the point is that the evidence is more than compelling. It really is, and hence the purpose of our class. You know, I want to spend a little time with this. Postmodernism. I'm sure most of you in this room have heard the term postmodernism. We've used that term here. Uh, Jerry has in his sermons uh, in the foyer. And how can postmodernism be kind of summarized? Because it, it has a lot of different permutations. But bottom line is postmodernism is the brief belief that truth is relative. That's really what, if you want to sum it all up, that's what postmodernism is. And we're living in a postmodern world where most of the, especially the intellectuals, quote unquote, uh, in, 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 in our society 
are in this postmodern world, and it's all about truth and the truth being relative. So what that means is your truth and the truth for you may not be the same truth for me. Um, you may be a Christian and that might be true for you, but that's not true for me. My, my truth, truth is based upon my experiences. And so therefore it becomes relative. And that's a real slippery slope to get into, isn't it? When truth starts becoming relative, anything and everything can happen. Uh, we, that's why we have these philosophers that are trying to define life, and some have even gone so far as to say that r life doesn't really begin, not only outside the womb, but even when someone's one or two years old. Truth is relative. Each society decides that. And so you have infanticide and all, so all sorts of things that are now being, uh, 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 being well, that's their truth, and that's their ethic. And that's what postmodernism is. And this is another great quote. I know it's a little bit long, but let's look at it. He's talking about, now, this is Peter Van Inwigen, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. And he's not a postmodernist, but he's talking about the postmodern people. He says, they are deeply hostile to the thought of anything in any sense stands in judgment over them. You can't be judgmental if you're postmodern. You're too judgmental. The idea towards they are most hostile is, of course, the idea of there being a God. They're really hostile about that. It's amazing how you can't be, post, you can't be judgmental, but they're judgmental about anybody that wants to believe in God. Kind of doesn't make sense, does it? But they are almost as hostile to the idea of there being an objective universe that doesn't care what they think and could, could make their most cherished beliefs false without even consulting with them. Very arrogant attitude in some of these people. But... That's what they believe. And it's, again, it's kind of contradictory when you think about it. You can't be judgmental, but you can't believe in God. Is that not making a judgment? They believe that there is no absolute truth, but rather truth is relative to the community in which we participate. Can you think of some communities that had some absolute truths? Yes, sir, I, I agree with that. Yeah, I mean, the one that comes to mind, obviously, is the... Nazi Germany, right, uh, pre-war, post-war, or, or during the World War II. And the truth, was that relative to kill how many millions of Jews and other people that did not hold to the, to the Nazi doctrine? Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Truth is not relative. Don't want to beat this with a dead horse, but truth is not relative. There is a truth. We may not, not know the truth. We may debate on what that truth is, but there is a truth, and it is not relative. And Jesus said, or excuse me, uh, Apostle said, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Once again, truth is not relative. And this is a quote from Dr. William Craig. To assert that the truth, excuse me, to, to assert that the truth is, there is no truth, is both self-refuting and arbitrary. For if this statement is true, it is not true since there is no truth. Did you get all that? <laughs> but that's true. I mean, what, what that, it, to, to assert there is no truth is making a statement of some sort of truth. So it's self-refuting. It's senseless. How about mysticism? Um, you know, we don't think of mysticism too much in our society, but it, obviously it's out there. There are people that believe that your spirituality is your spirituality. You don't have to go to church. You can... You can Come to God through nature, and you can uh, you can be spiritual, or you, you can be you know whatever th through mysticism. And the idea of mysticism to me means kind of the idea of enlightenment. And that's what Buddhism and, and Confucianism and other of uh, those type of mystical doctrines are all about. It's kind kind of coming to a, an understanding of the universe through your through your experience and through a mystical experience. Well, that was going on during the time of the Christians as well. And we would have called that Gnosticism. That's what Gnosticism really was all about. It was a coming of, uh, of Gnosis um, through uh, an enlightenment. And the idea of hieros gamos that was used in the Da Vinci Code, that's what mysticism was. And so you don't need the Bible. You don't need someone telling you what's right or wrong. Uh, you, can be, you can become spiritual just through this idea of enlightenment and and you know, meditation and this sort of thing. The problem with that is that's never going to bring one to the truth, is it? They may feel better about themselves. You know, they may be good people uh, and, and that sort of thing, but it's never, going to, it's never going to bring them to Christ. So 
the idea that mysticism can substitute for, for, for Christ and for Christianity, I just believe not to be true. David Hume, who was a Scottish philosopher, uh, 18th or 17th century, I forget exactly now what century he lived in, but he was a skeptic. And he wrote this in his Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding. And I want to read this to see how does Christianity fit in this? Because he was a non-believer, obviously. He was a skeptic. He, didn't, he, he was a non-believer. So he looked at, at uh, Christianity and he answers these questions. So these are his answers to the questions that we're going to read. He says, if we take in hand any volume of divinity or school of metaphysics, for, for instance, let us ask, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quality or number? And he answers the question, no. How would you answer that question? I think the Bible answers the question, yes, it does. Mysticism doesn't, but let's get to the next question. Does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning matters of fact or existence? Again, he says, no. Well, that's what this class is all about. I think it does show uh, matters of fact and evidences of existence. But if you read the Bible and you came to the conclusions he did, you would commit it to flame for it, contain, for it can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. And that's what we're trying to dis, disprove here. Christianity is not sophistry or, dis, um, or, or illusion. And I think we can refute what David Hume said many, many uh, years ago. All right, we're going to get into the uh, historical part of our study now and get into evolution, which I think most everybody's been waiting for. <laughs> so we will get into that. And today, and if we don't finish this today, we'll finish it next week and then get into how uh, the, the current state of evolution. If you haven't picked up that handout, there's plenty of those handouts in the foyer. I think it's listed as, as lesson three. And we're going to look at uh, evolution from a historical point of view. Darwin wrote his book, on the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. It was published in 19, excuse me, 1859. What would that be? Close to 150 years ago? It was a long time ago. Um, I frequently say origin of these species, and I may slip up and say that from time to time, but the actual title of the book is On the Origin of Species, not these species. And it was called, and in fact, the, the newest edition of, of his book, I've got a picture uh, on this particular slide in the classroom of that book, and it was called, in the, in the introduction of that book, one of the most important books ever written. It was an important book. I don't, wouldn't classify it as the most important book ever written. I've got a book that was much more important than it. But it was certainly a book that changed the way society looked at things, and the way mankind looked at things. But it's, it's been around now for some 150 years. And even when it was, even when it was written, and this was based, uh, uh, I think, on the 100, 100th anniversary of the book, Julius Huxley, who was the grandson of Thomas Huxley, who was a professor, Julius was a professor at Rice University. And he made the statement in 1959 that the first point to make about Darwin's theory, it is no longer a theory, but a fact. And so this was 50 years ago. Darwinianism, and that's his description of it, has come of age, so to speak. We are no longer having to bother about establishing the fact of evolution. So that was 50 years ago, 100 years after the book was written. Closer to our time is, is, our, is our friend who we'll be seeing a lot of in this class, and that's Richard Dawkins. And again, Richard Dawkins has written several books. He's very well known. Um, he's, he's seen a lot in debates and that sort of thing. And he's written The Blind Watchmaker and The God Delusion, along with a lot of others. He's a professor of Oxford, at Oxford. And he said that the theory is about as much in doubt as the earth goes around the sun. Now, if that's true, then we should just stop this class and go on to something else. But that's just totally not true. And it's it's an absurd statement, to be honest with you, because the theory is not in his, about, about, it's in his mind it is, and in a lot of people's mind it is. So the book, Origin of Species, really changed the way men looked at, uh, at, at life, the way men looked at science, and it has continued to uh, be the, one of the main uh, theories or, or postulates that's held by the scientific community, especially the biologic community. What was going on before, though, before Darwin? Before Darwin, we had the typological model. And what does that mean? Well, when you were, when you were um, 
putting animals in classes, you used a typological model. And what that meant is you looked at the animals and you look how they most closely resembled each other and features that they had with each other and you put them in those kind of classes, okay? So that's why you would have mammals. They had certain characteristics that were common to them. You would have birds. Those were certain characteristics, obviously, with them and, and the fishes and so forth. Everything was used on a typological model. And it was more or less assumed that the typological model was there because that's the way these animals were created. Not how they evolved, but how they were created. And so that was the model that was used. And it was understood that species were immutable. What does the word immutable mean? It means they didn't change. You didn't have any change within species. Species remained pretty much the way they were. Now, they understood variation. I wouldn't say they didn't understand variation. You know, dogs and cats, they all different kind of breeds of dogs and cats. Uh, the scientists before Darwin understood that. But they would say that species were immutable, and certainly they would believe that one species couldn't develop into a different species. And there's a problem, and we're gonna, we're gonna address it now, and we're gonna address it later on in the class as well. And the problem is in the definition of species, okay? You've got to look real closely how species are, are defined. Even Darwin pointed this out in his book, Origin of Species. And that is sometimes the species are real close to each other. And you could say, well, species are immutable. One species doesn't become a species. Depends on how you define species, doesn't it? I mean, the finches that Darwin looked at in the Galapagos Islands, we'll, which we'll study in this class at all, he, those were different species, but they were still finches. They were still birds. So does the Bible use the word species? No, it doesn't. Use the words, what, what word does it use? Kind. kind. So we'll spend a little bit of time looking at this because there's a difference between kind and species in my opinion. Kind in the Bible doesn't equal species. So when we say species are immutable, they might have been wrong about that before, the first, before Darwin, because species certainly do change. Uh, but they don't become different kinds. And again, we'll spend more time on that, but this was the prevailing thought of the time, and that is, again, that species did, were immutable. There was no change from one species to the, to the other. One of the leading <clears throat> taxonomists and biologists of his time, Louis Agassiz, who was a professor at Harvard, and there's a chair uh, in his name at Harvard to this day, very, very well known. How did he look, very well known a scientist and biologist, how did he look upon uh, the biological world? And we'll quote, quote him here. The living wor world shows also premeditation, wisdom, prescience, omniscience, and providence. All these facts proclaim aloud the one God who man may know, and the natural history must in good time become the analysis of the thoughts of the creator of the universe, as manifested in the animal and vegetable kingdoms, as well as the inorganic world. And Agassi was a contemporary of, of, uh, of uh, uh, Darwin, and this was his belief. And this was, uh, I would say, probably the prevailing belief amongst most scientists of the biologic world. They understood they understood by looking at the biologic world that there was, there was wisdom, premeditation, prescience, providence, and that it all just didn't come about by, a, by, by sheer chance. Even Darwin felt that at, at first. You know, he was, he was a, Darwin was a, 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 a Christian, if you will. And in fact, he has his degree in the, had his degree in theology. He was not, his degree was not in science. It was in theology at Cambridge. And he held to that belief, although he obviously had some idea of evolution because his grandfather proposed the idea of ev evolution before him. What was another prevailing thought? Catastrophism, if I'm saying that correctly. Catastrophism, I'm not sure, but one of those, some of y'all can help me out, I don't know. But what was this idea? And that was things occurred because of catastrophic changes in nature, okay? All the formations we see geologically and this was before Darwin and before Charles Lyell especially. The idea was catastrophism and that is that things occurred in nature, you know, the, the formations that we see were all due to catastrophic changes. And that's how the world began. Uh, not, not, not began, but that, that, that explained the formations that we see in the world and the world that they saw at that, day, at that time. For example, if, uh, if you were looking at the Grand Canyon, you would look at that as a result of some sort of catastrophic uh, event. Now, 
believe it or not, there's a turn, there's beginning to be a little bit of turn back to catastrophism now because geologists are having a hard time explaining some things through uniformitarianism, which we're going to speak about in just a minute. So there's kind of a shift back towards this idea. But this was the prevailing thought before, before uh, uh, Darwin and, and again Charles Lyell. But then you had some people that started saying, not everybody held to this one uh, universally. Catastrophism, uh, gradualism, they didn't hold to this universally. And some started looking at the, the idea of transmutation. You had Buffon and Lamarck, French uh, uh, biologists and scientists who started looking at the idea of transmutation. And then as we mentioned, Erasmus uh, Darwin, which was Charles Darwin's grandfather. So what is transmutation? Well, that's the, that, you know, that's the op opposite of the topographic uh, idea that we had, uh, that we talked about before. Transmutation would be that species are mutable, that they're not immutable, that they do change. And this idea was postulated well before Darwin, even including his, his, uh, his grandfather. So it wasn't new to Darwin. What changed the world to a large extent, and we mentioned this already, was a fellow by the name of Charles Lyell, again, a Scottish uh, uh, scientist. And he published, this isn't the entire title of his book, it was too big to really put in here, but let's just call it Principles of Geology. And this came out before Origin of Species. It came out before Darwin made his trip on the Beagle, actually. And, and, and Lyle believed that whatever geologic processes we see today, or he was seeing at his time, came about from the very same thing that was going on at, at his time, or I would use the word our time. So there was no big catastrophes that changed the world. It was all, again, gradualism uniformitarianism. So whatever process were going on uh, during his time were the processes that were responsible for the, the geologic formations that he saw. He specifically denied the global flood that we read about in the, in the Bible, in the book of Genesis. Charles Lyell would say there's no evidence for that. That's his opinion. And so he, believe it or not, that was a big deal. That was a big deal because before that it was this idea of catastrophism and now you got, okay, the processes that are going on now have always been going on. The, the world can't be explained uh, uh, by catastrophism. And so uh, it, it changed a lot of people's thought. And in fact, it was really a, a, a big thing or a big reason that Darwin came up with his theory. And he, we have a quote here in a, in a few minutes where he, uh, he gives credit to Charles Lyell. But is this what the Bible says? Well, of course not. And we know... Uh, Peter talks about this in his epistle, 2 Peter 3, verses 3 through 6. Peter says, Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Sounds like uniformitarianism to me. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. The Bible certainly speaks of a universal flood and kind of uh, goes against the idea of uniformitarianism. And again, this was the quote I was alluding to just a minute ago. Charles Darwin, this was at the death of, of, Charles, of Charles Lyell when he was uh, eulogizing him in print, he said, I never forget that almost everything which I have done in science, I owe to the study of his great works. So it was an important work. It, turned, it changed the way science and scientists looked at the world, and it certainly influenced Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin was born February the 12th, 1809. Very interesting date. It was the exact same date that Abraham Lincoln was born in the United States. Just kind of a, a curious thing. But uh, so obviously Charles Darwin and, and uh, <clears throat> Abraham Lincoln would have, would have been born uh, on the same day and would have been contemporaries with each other. He was born, Charles Darwin I'm talking about, he was born to a sort of aristocratic family. It has been said that his father was a quote, wealthy doctor. And his grandfather, Rasmus Darwin, was also a physician. So Charles Darwin was really supposed to be a doctor. He went to the, his, 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 uh, his father, he was not really interested in medicine. He was interested more in sport, you know, fishing and shooting and things like that. And being born aristocrat, he had the funds to do that. 
So he was sent to uh, Edinburgh University to study medicine. Edinburgh University during his time was probably the major seat of the study of medicine in the entire world. And it still is to some extent, very, very important. Uh, and many people came from all over the world to go to the University of Edinburgh. Well, he got there and it became obvious that medicine wasn't really for him. So instead of that, what was the second outlet that uh, wealthy, wealthy children would do to, to, as far as their avenue of study? A lot of times it fell back on the church. And so then he, his dad sent him to Cambridge and he studied theology at, at the University of Cambridge. And he got his theology degree in 1831. Odd that a man that changed the world scientifically, his background came from a theologic background. Now, was he interested in being a preacher? No. No, he was, that wasn't his interest. He had to study something, and his dad sent him there. Now he was at Cambridge. He really started studying more than just theology. <clears throat> he started looking at the natural sciences, and he had professors there that were involved in geology and the natural sciences. So he took a special interest to those things. So much so that when uh, the HMS Beagle was going to, to take a trip around the world under Captain Robert Fitzroy, they were looking for naturalists. <coughs> Darwin was like the third or fourth one. He's not the guy they first picked out. The, the, you gotta remember, this was gonna be a five-year voyage around the world. So I would imagine there wouldn't be just a whole lot of volunteers that would be ready to give up five years of their life. But he was a young man, as you, as you can tell. He was born in 1809. This, uh, this voyage started in 1831. He was in his 20s then, very young man. And he volunteered to do this. Now, exactly what a naturalist does on a voyage around the world, I'm not exactly 100% sure, but they look at nature, they look at, they look at uh, various insects and flowers and other animals that they would come in contact in other parts of the world. And obviously as a result of that, uh, Darwin took many notes. That this is just to show you that it was a complete round the world trip. But the place that of, of most interest for our minds was the Galapagos Islands. Because what happened at the Galapagos Islands? This was a series of islands that were miles apart from each other and they are off the coast of uh, Peru. You know, if you, uh, if you went to, to, no, Ecuador, excuse me, off the course of Ecuador. If you went to Ecuador and you went about 300 miles, I guess it would be west, you would run into the Galapagos Islands. And what he did, we saw various animals there. He saw turtles, he saw birds, he saw plants, just many, many different animals. And some of these animals, although they were turtles, they had different characteristics than the turtle on one island had, okay? And of course, the one that gets the most mentioned in the books were the finches, and the finches were these little birds. And, and, and Darwin noticed that the beaks on these finches were different uh, depending on what island they lived in. Their size was different depending on what island they, they, they lived on. What they ate was different depending on what island they, they lived on. And this became the basis of his theory of evolution. Now, I don't think Darwin took this five-year trip to necessarily come up with his theory of evolution. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But as a process of this, and then many years after the trip, the voyage lasted, what did we say, five years? And it began in 1831, ended in 1836. When was, when was uh, Origin of Species written or published? 1859, it was a long time after this voyage. So he had a lot of time to think about this stuff. And, uh, and after doing so, and reading other people's work, especially uh, Wallace Russell's work, uh, he became convinced that these changes were all due to what he termed, or what, what has been termed evolution. And it was a big deal. And as Michael Denton points out in his book, uh, Evolution of Theory and Crisis, this voyage of the Beagle became, quote, symbolic of the much greater voyage which the whole of our culture subsequently made from the, the narrow fundamentalism of the Victorian era to the skepticism and uncertainty of the 20th century. Darwin's experiences during those five years became the experiences of the world. And I think that's a valid, a valid comment. <clears throat> so as we said, Darwin began work on the origin of species by means of natural selection, and he published it in 1859, and it literally changed the world. It sold out the first day it hit the market. So it's like one of these, the book goes to the bookstore, and there ain't any more books left, you know, that real quickly. That's a pretty distinct phenomenon. I guess it still happens today, but it certainly happened with this book. And that's our bell to end this class. We will finish this study on uh, the historical data as far as Darwin and get into what the current thoughts are on evolution next week.